question. So I know we're all enjoying conversation and meeting new friends and uh, look forward to that continuing. But uh, we're gonna continue on now with uh, Dr. Peter D'Onofrio, who's a member of our Global Medical Advisory Board. We're pleased to have him here. And uh, he's going to talk to us about vaccinations. So, Dr. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to speak uh, on this topic of vaccination in GBS. I know it's controversial. Um, I know that some of you in the audience probably already have your ideas on this topic. What I'd like to do is give you as much hard incontrovertible data as I possibly can um, to let you come to your own conclusion. And what I'm gonna talk about today are vaccinations as they relate to GBS and CIDP and no other illnesses, and I'm going to focus in on the influenza vaccination and not other vaccinations. So first of all, what is the difference between a vaccination and immunization? So a vaccination is a shot that you usually get in your deltoid area or your triceps area, very tiny needle, usually October and November. It is an antigen, it's a protein, and then your body develops antibodies against that antigen. On the other hand, immunization is a process by which your body becomes fortified usually with an IV infusion of immune globulin. So for instance, if you've ever been um, immunized for hepatitis B, um, it's usually a series of uh, immunizations, not vaccinations against hepatitis B. So it, it actually, when it comes to immunology, there's a big difference between the two of them. <coughs> so we're gonna talk a little bit um, I just want to introduce you to Guillain-Barre, one slide. It was first reported in 1916, when 1916 was 100 years ago. And it was first reported in two French soldiers in July of 1916. And it was reported by three French um, physicians, Guillain-Barre and Stroll, and um, for some reason, Stroll must not have been nearly as popular as the other two guys. <coughs> and by 1925, all articles on Guillain-Barre Stroll were um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now really, Guillain-Barre syndrome should not be called Guillain-Barre syndrome. It should be called Landry's ascending paralysis. Why is that? Well, in 1859, 1859, 70 years before this, um, Landry, a French neurologist, described five cases of what would become Guillain-Barre syndrome. And for some reason, he was forgotten when Guillain-Barre and Stroll reported this in 1916. So it was reported in two French soldiers in July of 1916 in the Battle of the Somme, S-O-M-E. The Somme is famous because it was, re the respons it was responsible for the deaths of one million French, British, and German soldiers during World War I. Just one other caveat, if you like literature and you like Tolkien, Tolkien was a professor of English at Oxford University in England. He was drafted into the British Expedi Expeditionary Forces in 1916. And during the Battle of the Somme, during lapses, he was creating the outline for Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. So, pretty interesting stuff. Fortunately, he did well. He wasn't wounded, he went back to England. Many years later, he wrote The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. So enough for history. So Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, is a subacute onset, causes weakness in the arms and legs, 
and loss of reflexes. There is minimal sensory loss. Now, 70% of people with Guillain-Barre can identify a preceding viral illness or bacterial illness. Often, they're benign. Often, they will forget they had it. Um, it's usually an upper respiratory tract infection or it's a gastrointestinal infection. 30% require uh, intubation and 90% of people reach their maximum benefit at four weeks. Guillain-Barre has always had a relatively good prognosis even before plasma exchange and IVIG. 65% of people make a good recovery, 20% or 65% of people make a full recovery, 20% a good recovery, and 15% are left with some deficits. So the issue of the flu vaccine and Guillain-Barre all came about because of an epidemic of Guillain-Barre in 1976, 40 years ago. And what happened was uh, this flu vaccine, which was an H1N1, um, led to about a nine to tenfold increase in the number of Guillain-Barre patients over what would have been expected. So up to that point, Guillain-Barre was seen in about one out of every million people. And the increase from the H1N1 flu vaccination in 1976 went up about 9.5%. So the federal government created a national influenza immunization program surveillance. They looked at 100 or 1,098 patients with Guillain-Barre from October 1976 to January 31st of 1977. They identified 532 patients who had had Guillain-Barre, who had had the New Jersey influenza vaccination. 15 of the people were discarded because the vaccination occurred after the onset of the Guillain-Barre. But they were able to determine that there was an increase above baseline of 9.5 cases per million within six weeks of the vaccination. So pretty impressive data. In the unvaccinated group, the attack rate was a little bit less than one per million. The greatest risk for a GBS was within five weeks. So this is a graph from a classic article by Schoenberg, published three years later. And what this shows, and I wish I could, I guess I can't show it very well here, but the histogram here shows the increased number of cases of Guillain-Barre that occurred within the first six weeks after the vaccination. After that, the number of cases really regressed to about the number that would have occurred without the vaccination. <coughs> and it's for that reason that anyone who received the flu vaccination and then had Guillain-Barre within six weeks was thought to have Guillain-Barre as a result of that vaccination. But if we look at data from relating Guillain-Barre to infections, you will see that the incidence of Guillain-Barre is far greater from influenza infections, that is natural infections with influenza compared to the vaccination. Um, these are five studies that looked at the incidence or prevalence of Guillain-Barre following the natural flu infection. And you can, see, you can see here that in the first one, a 14% of people with Guillain-Barre had blood studies consistent with influenza A. Uh, in the second study, Guillain-Barre cases after influenza uh, peaked in the winter months and there were 60% six, of patients had an influenza type illness prior to the onset of Guillain-Barre. In the third study, 
there was an 18-fold increased risk of Guillain-Barre after the influenza-like illnesses, and then we can go on and on. So the incidence of Guillain-Barre after natural flu infection is considerably greater than it is for the flu vaccine. <laughs> so the next study, these are 10 studies looking at Guillain-Barre after influenza immunization. So we're not talking about natural infection, we're talking about the immunization. There are 10 studies the very first one here is the one I've already talked about, the 1976-77. All the other ones are years later, after 1976-1977. And what you'll see in the far right column, outcome, many of the studies, no increase in Guillain-Barre. One study showed a decrease in Guillain-Barre after vaccination, and then other ones showed maybe one additional case per million patients who are vaccinated. <laughs> if you look at the variation of preceding infections prior to getting Guillain-Barre, not just looking at influenza, but other infections as well, if you look in the far left column, that is after the exposure, there are 553 cases, number exposed. Note that there is an increase after influenza illnesses, but notice that there's even a greater one from polio vaccination and very high after an acute respiratory infection and infectious intestinal disease. So um, actually the incidence of GBS after other types of infections is higher than it is with influenza. <laughs> so what has been done recently to look at the topic of G GBS after flu vaccinations? Well, here is a study that's three years old, Roger Baxter at um, Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. So this would be San Francisco and Sacramento and uh, the uh, Palo Alto area. Kaiser Permanente is a very large healthcare company in Northern California. They take care of between three and four million people. So what Roger decided to do was to look at all subjects with Guillain-Barre over a 12-year period of time, from 1994 to 2006. All these people, he only looked at hospitalized patients because we know that almost all people with Guillain-Barre end up in the hospital. And anybody classified as Guillain-Barre not hospitalized would raise red flags that this person never really had GBS in the first place. <coughs> Excuse me. All cases were reviewed by a neurologist. They analyzed cases with preceding influenza vaccination of nine months, even though the paper by um, Schoenberger showed that the increased incidence was only six weeks after the vaccination. Now, if you look at it, they looked at 896 cases that were thought to be due to Guillain-Barre. But when they were reviewed by the neurologist, less than half of those, 415 cases, were truly cast classified as GBS. Now, that is important because what may appear to be Guillain-Barre may not be Guillain-Barre when you try to classify it according to the definition of Guillain-Barre, which would be weakness in all four limbs, uh, hypo or areflexia, and then maybe some mild sensory loss and an elevated protein and spinal fluid. So less than half of the cases that Baxter and his group looked at actually had Guillain-Barre. Only 25 patients had received the vaccination before the onset of Guillain-Barre, and they were, there were several types. It wasn't just the flu. <coughs> they noticed that there was a higher incidence of Guillain-Barre in the late winter months, which is well known. In fact, one of the reasons that we give the flu vaccine in October 
is because we know that um, natural flu infections tend to occur in November, December, and January. The important data is that Baxter was unable to find any association between any of the vaccines, not just the flu vaccine and Guillain-Barre. And he looked back, and of the 18 cases of people who had gotten a flu vaccine, 13 of those 18 also remembered a respiratory or GI infection before they developed GBS. Well, if they had an infection before GBS, it's much more likely that the GBS resulted from the infection than the flu vaccination. In fact, there were only five people who didn't have an infection but had received the flu vaccination. <coughs> Excuse me. The Institute of Medicine is an organization in Washington, D.C. In 2012, they published a very large textbook on the topic of vaccinations and illnesses, many of them neurologic. And they looked at vaccinations and CIDP and GBS and many other illnesses, transverse myelitis, infection, autism. And they came out with two statements looking at Guillain-Barre and vaccinations. The first statement is there is insufficient evidence to determine a causal relationship between the influenza vac vaccines and GBS. And this would be after 1976. There was also inadequate evidence of an association between GBS and measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, hepatitis A or B, human papillovirus, diphtheria, tetanus toxoid, and a cellular pertussis vaccine. There was another study done uh, looking at another H1N1 vaccine. And remember that the H1N1 vaccine was the one in 1976-77 that led to the spike in cases of GBS. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when the government realized that in 2009-2010, H1N1 vaccine would contain um, or when they realized that the vaccine would contain an H1N1 vaccine, they were on the lookout for an increased spike of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And so what they did is they, they created the Emerging Infectious Infections Program. That is, they developed a program that would look out for additional cases of Guillain-Barre. They pursued an active surveillance program from October of 2009 to May of 2010. They looked at 45 million patients in 10 states in the United States, and actually Tennessee was chosen as one of those 10 states. They had the medical charts reviewed by trained officers. They then did a telephone questionnaire in people with suspected Guillain-Barre syndrome, and they looked at their vaccination history. So they came up with 707 suspected cases of Guillain-Barre, but after they pursued them, only 411 truly had Guillain-Barre based upon a review of the medical records. 349 were confirmed, 62 were probable. And if you do this, this kind of work, the term probable Guillain-Barre or probable any illness always leaves you wondering whether they truly had Guillain-Barre or the other illness. So Wise and his group found that there was a very tiny spike in cases of Guillain-Barre, 0.74 cases per one million. So this would translate into one additional case for every one, for every one million 300,000 people receiving the flu vaccine. This would be in addition to the baseline 
of the uh, 0 0.79 per million described several years before. They mentioned that this was a tenfold lower risk than from the 1976 swine flu vaccination. The interpretation of the results may have been influenced by the 62 probable cases. In fact, if the probable cases were eliminated, and there's probably some reason to think that that might be a good idea, then the increase would have been closer to one additional case of Guillain-Barre for every two million people receiving the vaccine. In addition, because this was a telephone surveillance, when you call up people, they may have forgotten that they had an antecedent illness, like the flu, when you're calling them several years later. So this data did show a very tiny blip in the increase of the number of cases of Guillain-Barre, but very tiny. <coughs> so what about Guillain-Barre and CIDP, this is the first time I'm mentioning CIDP, what happens if you give these people the flu vaccine? Well, this was a questionnaire um, in Europe. This was published in the Journal of the Purple Nerve Society, 2009. What they did is they called up 245 people with Guillain-Barre in the past and 76 with CIDP. They first learned that about 9% of those um, people with GBS and five with CIDP had been diagnosed as having other disorders that were autoimmune. What would they have been? Well, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome. We heard a little bit about scleroderma today. So it's possible looking back that their cases of Guillain-Barre may have arisen from the autoimmune diseases. In addition, if they developed an autoimmune disease, that might explain better any recurrence of the disease as opposed to the flu vaccine. But this is interesting. None of the 106 Guillain-Barre patients after receiving a flu vaccination had any recurrence of symptoms. Now that's a pretty small number, but none, zero out of 106 is impressive. Five of 24 CIDP patients after vaccines had a slight worsening of symptoms and then they resolved after a few weeks. Pain, fatigue, reduced quality of life, were reported in 70% of patients with both Guillain-Barre and CIDP, and many of you in the audience here might have those same complaints of pain, fatigue, and reduced quality of life. Their conclusion was the flu vaccination is relatively safe for both patients with CIDP and Guillain-Barre. What does our own organization say about flu vaccinations? So this is the GBS CIDP Foundation. We're all at the meeting. What does their website say about this? Where the first comment, and by the way, these are not guidelines. These are simply comments made by our organization. The first one I put in quotes, no, you shouldn't let fears of a scary nerve system disease stop you from getting the flu shot. Um, and in the vernacular, that means that you always have to weigh positives and potential negatives. But what they're saying is that the flu vaccination is still a very good thing for most people. The next statement is very important. The natural flu is much more likely to result in Guillain-Barre than the flu vaccine. And this is overwhelmingly correct. And I'll show you some data of what happens if you don't get the flu shot in a few minutes. The risk of serious complications from the natural flu outweighs that of acquiring GBS. And again, I'll hit upon that. The most common organisms giving rise to Guillain-Barre, 
our Campylobacter jejuni, which is 40% of cases, and that Campylobacter is a bacteria, not a virus, and there's no vaccination for it. So if we look at the CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, uh, you've probably heard a lot about them this year because of the Zika virus. So these are the recommendations for this year, 2016 to 17. Who should be vaccinated? Well, everyone who is at least six months of age, and that's a large group of people. People who are at high risk for developing serious complications like pneumonia if they contract the flu. So this is anyone who has a medical condition such as asthma, diabetes, chronic renal failure, and chronic lung disease. A lot of people in this world who have those. Pregnant women. People 50 years and older, and I think that's probably most of the people in this room, that is certainly me, and that number was just revised from 65 down to 50 this year. All American Indians and Alaskan Natives, extremely obese people who have BMIs greater than 40 because they're more prone to infection, and anyone who's a resident of a nursing home or assisted living, and anyone who works at those places. People who live with or care for others who are high risk of developing serious complications. They include household contacts, caregivers with certain medical conditions, including asthma, diabetes, and chronic lung disease. Who else should be vaccinated? People with prior allergies to eggs should be vaccinated in an outpatient setting and observed for 15 minutes for an anaphylactic reaction. So, and actually this has been diminished by the fact that there is now a vaccine that is not prepared with eggs. Who should not be vaccinated? This is a very small list. Who should not be vaccinated? Children younger than six months of age because the vaccine is not approved for this age group. Prior history of a severe reaction to any component of the flu vaccine. This implies a rapid onset within 15 to 30 minutes of the vaccination. People who have a current moderate to severe illness with a fever. So if you go to your doctor, you're sick and you have a fever, you shouldn't get the flu vaccination. You come back in two weeks when you're feeling better. <coughs> And then the one that's so pertinent to the people in this group, who should not be vaccinated? People with a history of Guillain-Barre syndrome occurring within six weeks after receiving the influenza vaccine and who are not at risk for severe illness from, influ from influenza, they should not get the vaccine. So it even says here, more or less, that if you've gotten Guillain-Barre within six weeks from a vaccination, you probably should still receive the vaccination if you have chronic renal disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, congestive heart failure, um, and if you're immune suppressed. So you can see the fourth dot there is a very narrow, short number of people. What are the vaccine options? And this is not my area of expertise, but most of you will receive the trivalent vaccine. So that is a vaccine that contains three different antigens, two for influenza A and one for influenza B. There are standard, there's a standard IM dose, which most of you will get. There is an intradermal trivalent one with a jet injector, so this is the quickest way to get it. <clears throat> there is a high dose injection approved for people above the age of 65, and apparently this is about 40 percent 
better at protecting you from the flu than the standard dose. There is now an egg-free trivalent injection, that is, it was not prepared using egg substrate. There is a new inactivated trivalent influenza vaccine, and the nasal vaccine is no longer available. And it's no longer available because it was very poorly affected. It was affected so infrequently that the CDC has decided not to let that be used. There is also a quadrivalent vaccine. So this is four vaccines in one, two for influenza A, two for influenza B. There is a standard dose. There is a cell-based quadrivalent influenza vaccine. If you read the CDC guidelines, it doesn't recommend one of these over another. You would think they would recommend the quadrivalent over the trivalent. They don't. They don't recommend the higher dose over the lower dose. They're leaving that up to your primary care doctor. <coughs> and frankly, I'm not sure how your primary care doctor is supposed to come to the conclusion. <coughs> so what about where I work? So I work in Middle Tennessee. So two years ago, Vanderbilt University, the medical center, has made flu vaccination mandatory. If you don't receive it or you don't have a tremendous justification by a physician, if you don't receive it, you don't have a job anymore. And this is actually a policy that many other medical centers have adopted, many before we did. Um, there is a statement several years old from the CDC. Um, MMWR is a publication called the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. comes out every week. And it stated that vaccination remain, remains the most effective method to prevent serious illness and death from the flu. And it's just as true now as it was six years ago. So here are important facts that you need to know. So if you're concerned about getting GBS from the flu, remember it's about one out of a million or maybe one out of one and a half million. Contrast that to this. You may be one of the almost half a million people hospitalized this year because you got the flu. You may be one of the 48,000 people who die from the flu. And that influenza is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. <coughs> so in summary, what have I talked about today? Um, I gave you uh, some background in the 1976-77 influenza immunization program. Um, I talked about Guillain-Barre after influenza infection. That's a natural infection with the flu. We talked about Guillain-Barre after influenza immunization. Many reports and after 1976, little if any evidence that it increases substantially or significantly the incidence of Guillain-Barre. We talked about the relative risk of GBS among vaccinated and unvaccinated adults. We talked about Roger Baxter's trial from Kaiser Permanente. Uh, we talked about the surveillance 2009 study by Dr. Y. I gave you a lot of information information on the flu vaccination guidelines. And then I'll just leave you with some data from 2009 that the morbidity and mortality of influenza and influenza-like illnesses results in a hospitalization in 222 people per 1 million. This is the flu. And a death rate of almost 10 per 1 million after the natural flu. And that's my final slide. So 
thank you for your attention, and I would welcome any questions. I was wondering, um, do you know if there's any correlation between, I gave vaccines for 22 years with the health department down in Florida, and then develop CIDP. Do you think there's any correlation between being exposed to these 50 million vaccines that I did for 22 years and coming down with CIDP? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I really don't have any answer to that. Um, I just, I don't know. And if I did answer it, it would it would just be conjecture. Yes, I was just curious: was the original study from the '70s ever redone or reevaluated to determine if it was flawed methodology or how they came up with the numbers they did? Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, it was actually um, the data was looked at. So the Schoenberg's paper was 1979. Langmuir, who was the Head Honcho at the CDC looked at the data again in 1984 and came up with the same results. A very good question. It was looked at twice. Yes? So I'm back on. Um, there doesn't appear to be any increased incidence of Guillain-Barre after the Zoster virus. I didn't come. There was really just about, there was no data on that. Uh, Dr. Yep. Kornbluth, um, I went to Peru last year and um, I took malaria pills with me and when I approached um, a clinic to give me a yellow fever vaccine, um, when she took my history, she said as an autoimmune uh, um, patient, she would not give me the yellow vaccine fever uh, vaccine because it was a live vaccine. Could you explain the difference between live vaccine, <coughs> modified live, and killed, and its relevance to all of this? Well, um, all the vaccines I talked about in my prior slides were in it, are inactivated. inactivated. They're dead. Okay. okay. A live vaccine is alive. So, um, the oral polio vaccine, the Sabin vaccine, is a live organism that has been modified in such a way that it cannot be infectious. A few years before the SALT vaccine that you got your three, or at least I got my three um, vaccinations, was inactivated and dead, and it wasn't shown to be quite as effective. So. Um, I think the person in Peru who made that decision made a decision based upon her concern over your well-being. Um, I'm not sure that that can be backed up by science. Now, if I travel to other countries, say Africa, and I require other vaccines that are live vaccines, will I be safe as a CIDP patient taking multiple live vaccines? Uh, I think you're going to be okay. Okay. And, and I'll look at it this way, too. I just presented a lot of data on the natural influenza vaccine. So if you're going to get a vaccine or a natural influenza infection, if you get the vaccinations, is there a possibility that your CIDP could, could get worse? Yes. Not very likely. What is the likelihood of you being sick, becoming sick, by yellow fever or malaria or whatever it might be, probably far greater than getting a worsening of your, of your CIDP. I got a tetanus booster and I got a major, major flare, the biggest one that I had since the original onset of this, mm -hmm. within 48 hours of the shot of the booster. Yes, and there are always stories like that. and. Um, all I can say is that I guess you need to be very careful about getting another tetanus vaccination. Uh, um, I spend a lot of time looking at this data and everyone has a story and everyone has a case report of what happened 
But what you need to do to really look at this scientifically is you need 45 million people um, who receive the H1N1 vaccine and is there, an up, is there a spike in incidence of whatever disease you're looking at. Um, one case here or there just doesn't mean a whole lot. I mean, it, it does to you, and I don't mean to minimize it, but from a scientific standpoint, it's just a case report. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, my first question is, are you convinced that you got Guillain-Barre after a flu vaccination? No. Okay. So your children's chances of getting Guillain-Barre are no greater than any other child, period. In fact, if you have Guillain-Barre, if you have a well-known case of Guillain-Barre, your chances of getting another bout of Guillain-Barre after a vaccination is no higher than it is without the vaccination. Well, we don't know. If, if you notice, I didn't say much on CIDP. I didn't say much on CIDP because there is just about no data. The data on vaccinations leading to CIDP, and I deliberately didn't use the word caused, um, there are three or four cases in the world's literature over the past 40 years. I just have a little vignette. I was diagnosed with GBS in 2008, and it was kicked in by a respiratory infection. I did not receive flu shots after that. I was re-diagnosed, um, or I had a flare-up last year, and then a second flare-up, and I was diagnosed with CIDP as opposed to GBS, each time kicked in by pneumonia. I had a conversation with my primary care doctor last week about maybe I should get a flu shot now, especially since it was CIDP, not GBS, and the risk of pneumonia was severe. It was agreed that I would attend this conference learn as much as I could and make the decision. In the meantime, he gave me a tetanus booster. I walked back in the room and said, we just made a mistake and gave you a flu vaccine. <laughs> so I'm here to say that ahead of time, before doing the research, I got my flu vaccine. <laughs> so um, let me just comment. So you were originally diagnosed as Guillain-Barre and then you had two flare-ups and they renamed it CIDP, which sounds appropriate. Um, having a flare of CIDP following any kind of infection is extremely common. Um, and if you came to my office, I would tell you to get the flu vaccine every year. And I do, and I do, and um, I document it in the chart, and I have no problem giving that news to you. <coughs> Why? Your chances of having a flare of your CIDP from the natural flu so far exceeds getting a flare from the flu vaccination that the decision for me is very easy. Any other? Yes. Is there any evidence or are you studying um, a higher incidence of uh, a combination of a flu shot, the high dose flu shot, and a pneumonia shot <coughs> given in combination leading to GBS? Uh, good question. I, I am not doing that. I am not lo doing research on that, and I don't know of anybody else who is looking at whether there's a higher incidence of, G of GBA after GBS after combination of flu and, let's say, pneumovax. I don't know of anybody who's doing that. Now, People at the CDC in Atlanta may have data on that. If they do, I haven't seen it published. I had a question. Is there any call it pooled immunity from the IVIG? I didn't quite catch that. Is there anything, call it pooled immunity from the IVIG? So 
people who are getting IVIG, let's say for CIDP, Correct. are they less likely to get recurrence after a flu shot? Or necessary to have the vaccination in the first place because they have with them a pooled immunity from the donor oh. population. That's a good question. I don't think anyone would tell you not to have the flu vaccination because you're doubly protected from having um, the IVIG. I, I don't, I, there's no data on it, and I think scientifically it's unlikely to, the, pool, the pooled immunity is unlikely to prevent you from getting the flu vaccination. We have time for one more question right over here. I had uh, GBS in 93, 10 days after the flu vaccine was paralyzed and I made a good recovery. A year and a half ago, I had the flu and I had severe GBS again. Are there such things as bad batches of vaccines? Someone mentioned something to me about that. Or is that a myth? And, sh and because of the flu vaccine and GBS connection, in 93, are my children safe to get the vaccine now? I'm not sure I followed your logic on the last question. So because you got the flu in 1993 from, from the, the flu vac from the vaccine, and how does that apply to your kids? Are, are they safe to get the flu vaccine? Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. That has nothing to do. Okay. It has nothing to do with you. There's no inherited link between the two of them. It's interesting, the, some people think that the flu vaccine last year was a bad batch. So the flu vaccine last year was only protective 23% of the time. You may have had friends who got the flu vaccine last year and got the flu because every year the scientists, when they're choosing the tri and quadrivalent, have to use an educated guess on which of the type A and type B, B vaccines are chosen. If they guess poorly, like last year, then the, it, it, only, it only protected against 23% of the viruses causing the flu. Most years it's about 50 to 60. I think you referred to a bad batch is something tainted in the vaccine that led to it. And what the way you look at that is you find out what batch was used, and then you ask the company to look into whether other people developed Guillain-Barre from the same lot or batch that you received in 1993. It was reported to the CDC. Well, thank, thank you, Dr. Let's give him a hand. You're welcome. We're going to take a quick break, uh, be back here in about eight minutes for the ever popular chair aerobics. I know Santo is warming up in the back, so we'll see you back here in a few. Yeah. 